Like many of you, I have spent more time looking at screens in the past few months than ever before. The average American has now begun to stream online content for eight hours or more each day. According to Verizon, U.S. video game usage during peak hours has gone up 75% since the quarantine first went into effect. Although we may be using screens more, are we really feeling connected, engaged, and energized? The purpose of this panel is to explore strategies the entertainment industry is using to drive better engagement and to understand what the future holds in terms of the immersive entertainment experience. In this panel, we will hear from experts in the corporate, startup, and academic spaces on where the industry is going. We will also talk about how human-computer interaction research can help drive more engaging experiences today and in the future. Although augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality technologies have massive implications across a wide variety of industries, today we are specifically focused on entertainment, which can include anything from movies, television, and other streaming content, to gaming, music, radio, sports, museums, and even theater. I would like to introduce Carly Johnston, who will be moderating this panel. Carly is the founder, co-founder of Virtual Method, an AR VR specialist production agency based in Sydney, and the co-founder of Women in AR VR Australia. In the past five years, Carly's worked heavily to pioneer emerging technology, tell compelling brand stories, and communicate directly with consumers in innovative, immersive, experiential, and personal ways. Carly, take it away. Thanks very much, Jessica. Um, I'm excited to MC this panel. Um, hello, everyone. And I'd love to um, uh, introduce the following panelists. So we have uh, Matt Meesnix, advisor to Niantic. Mark Billinghurst, Director of the Empathic Computing Lab and also recognised as one of the godfathers of AR. Bruce Thomas, Director of IVE at the University of South Australia. Rebecca Barkin, um, Vice President of Immersive Technology, uh, Immersive Experience and Platform Design at Magic Leap. And Trent Clues de Castella, um, Co-Founder of Foria. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Trent, I'm the Co-Founder and CEO of Foria. Uh, we're a Melbourne-based immersive technology startup. We cover the whole XR spectrum, uh, building some interesting software around digital twins, and uh, also building some pretty exciting, uh, almost like social impact experiences with um, VR and AR. We've been doing some good work recently with uh, Oculus, building a project called Ecosphere, and also previously with Netflix and Google and WWF around another project called Rewild. But really excited to jump in with you all today. Look forward to seeing what happens. Mark, did you want to go next then? Sure. So, um, I'm Mark Billinghurst. I'm the director of the Empathic Computing Lab at the University of South Australia and also University of Auckland. Uh, we do research on how we can use AR, VR and XR technology to enable people to better understand one another and to share experiences and feelings across large distances. So it's really super relevant for this um, COVID and post-COVID area. And I'm excited to be here today um, as well. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Perfect. Welcome. Um, Bruce, how about you? Do you want to go? Uh, yeah, good morning. I'm the uh, director of the Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments. Uh, we're uh, a research centre which marks labs in, in the research centre, uh, is uh, roughly 90 people. Uh, we cover all aspects of uh, virtual XR research. Uh, we also uh, are unique in the sense that uh, about half of the center is made up of people from the art, architecture and design disciplines. We have a real uh, focus on uh, end user applications, you know, doing the fundamental research, but then focused on solving real world problems. Very cool. Um, uh, Rebecca. Hi, uh, I'm Rebecca Barkin and I am vice president of platform design and immersive experience at Magic Leap. Um, which means I, I manage a big team of uh, an interdisciplinary team of developers and artists and strategists and producers. And we work to bring beautiful XR experiences onto the device with a particular focus in the last few years on location based experiences. So let's start by um, opening question, um, uh, defining the main acronyms out there in use of immersive technologies, AR, VR, and MR. Um, Mark, I know you uh, made a widely referenced uh, post um, on the definition on medium. Um, maybe we start with you on that one. 
Well, I mean, there's a lot of confusion about what those terms often mean, and different companies have appropriated them in different ways. But the term um, uh, AR and VR, or especially mixed reality, traces, traces back to Professor Paul Milgram in the mid or early 90s. And he basically imagined a continuum of how much the technology was used to generate your experience. On, on the one end, from the real world, when the technology is almost modifying nothing of what you experience, to the other end where you've got virtual reality, where you've got technology completely generating your experience and augmented reality is somewhere in the middle. And so in his opinion, mixed reality is everything between the ends of that continuum. So not including real the real world and not including virtual reality, but everything between those ends. But in recent years, that's been expanded to the term extended reality, which basically is everything including those ends of that continuum. And of course, mm -hmm. nowadays, people are starting to talk about spatial computing, which is basically uh, the same thing, but with, with an awareness of the spatial surroundings. And so some companies now are developing, like Magic Leap, developing spatial computing technology. But generally, when we talk about AR, we, in an academic sense, we're talking about technology that overlays content on, onto the real world. VR is replacing the real world with, with a digital experience. And MR is everything in that continuum between those extremes of the real world and virtual reality. Answer. Did anyone have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, I'd like to jump in. This is um, one of the things about uh, the experiences. We, we normally focus mostly on the vision and a little bit on the audio, but um, I think the, the vision of this is to, is, to, is to have all the senses uh, stimulated by it. That includes smell, taste, and uh, haptics, which is uh, the sense of touch and tactile. So I, I think the future is moving into these new senses. Mm. Very cool. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. So there's no question that COVID has had a dramatic impact on the immersive entertainment industry. From an R&D perspective, what exciting new developments are coming out of immersive research in and out of Australia that will inform the future of um, our entertainment experiences? Well, I can talk to that briefly. So um, the really great thing about immersive technologies is that we can use the technologies to bring location to people rather than people to locations. Um, and entertainment is really about a combination of product, um, location, and, and people. So um, at the University of South Australia, we've been doing some research now and using um, 360 video streaming and especially 3D scene capture and sharing to enable people to capture their surroundings and then share that anywhere in the world. So that means now, uh, for example, a, a tour guide operator in um, Australia who previously gave wine tours in the wine region, whose business now is impacted because they don't, can't have international tourists, now can take that um, experience and, and ship it uh, globally. And similarly, companies like Disney, who previously, you know, people had to come to the locations, now can capture those locations and also send that lo locally as well. There's no reason why I couldn't be having dinner in New York and then pop into Australia in the evening to visit a concert and experience that in 360 or 3D, and then go back after the concert to to sleep in my apartment in New York. If I could chime in quickly, um, one thing that I'm pretty excited about that's really just coming out this week, um, two things in particular. Um, Facebook released something called PyTorch, which is around converting uh, 3D avatars from a 2D video feed of a person. And then uh, mean, meanwhile, uh, another company called Substance, they do a lot of 3D terrains and textures and meshes. and now they have the ability to create, uh, you know, 3D environmental textures from a photograph. And so I kind of imagine in due course, you know, we'll, we'll be piping in our old uh, catalog of, of old family videos and then recreating, you know, volumetric memories that we can go back and you know, show our loved ones and remember. Yeah, very uh, cool. Also, um, pretty excited about Unity Mars project. I think that's anything that helps make making this stuff easier and auto detection of different environments and the ability for the content to sort of adapt intelligently to, to the environment that it has is going to be great for the overall industry. And then I think there's some some really critical uh, infrastructure work that that's really important. Um, you know, things that support remote rendering um, are going to re be really important for bringing, you know, great immersive stadium scale uh, experiences, um, bettering the volumetric, you know, pipeline for capture and compression and, and being able to stream it. Um, and I think in general, like improvements to, to form factor, to, uh, 
you know, field of, field of view, um, computer vision in general, um, all, as all of that stuff starts to really mature, um, it makes it a lot easier to deploy um, these experiences, which is something that like we sometimes overlook. And the, uh, the bottom line is like right now, these are uh, difficult to make and <laughs> expensive and uh, to deploy. But I think there's a lot of really exciting developments that are helping to make uh, that a lot easier and, and more cost efficient. And, and COVID certainly acted um, as, the, as the catalyst that, that nobody wanted, um, but has been really useful in getting people to try new things like virtual concerts and whatnot that maybe they were a bit hesitant to do before. And all that helps support the, the category growing. So right. I just would like to chime in a bit. So uh, there's been a kind of a revolution, obviously, in AR and VR with uh, displays like Magic Leap. People have been able to actually make real applications now. Um, and so what's uh, one of the big areas that, that, that I work in is in interactions. And so now we actually have real devices and we can make real applications that people would like to experience. And so now we're able to explore how do people interact in, in the worlds? Because frankly, a lot of the research has been in the fundamental sensor technology and display technology just to get us to this point. So now how do you get people to experience these worlds in a, uh, in a more immersive way? And, and I, I mentioned before, one, one area we're working in is, is in what's known as redirected haptic, uh, passive haptics. And the idea is that when you press a button, you want to physically press a button. <laughs> or use a joystick. And so, but you don't want to have um, a special control for every game that you have. You, ha you don't want to buy, you know, another device. But if you had one device with a bunch of buttons on it and joysticks and dials and things, and basically it automatically virtually reconfigures to whatever control panel you're using whatever device. And then the system tricks you into pressing only you know, there's only three buttons, but you think there's 50 buttons on your panel. So it tricks you into pressing those three buttons. Um, I, I think these ideas of, of trying to make the devices more intuitive, um, you know, and, and, and more immersive, you can't do everything with hand gestures, which is a very powerful interaction metaphor, but people like to actually touch something. When they pick up a cup, they want to feel the cup when they pick it up. I think that's a really good point. Like this. This is so, so important to even creators, like content developers, being able to feel like they can really create the worlds and the experiences that they want with a sense of agency. And I think there's some really interesting developments uh, as you get into like cross-modal and transmodal uh, ways of, of, of leveraging input modalities. So like you can, you know, use both uh, something that's really intelligently leveraging gaze and gesture at the same time to dial in a meaningful interaction like much quicker than you than you could before. And these things will all help make it so much more intuitive uh, mm. to use because they're they're much more favorable to like he real human behavior. Yeah, great answers, guys. Um, next question, perfect. So since the Mandalorian TV series and because of COVID, much of Hollywood has shifted across to real-time rendered virtual production environments with LED screens. Australia has a significant film resources and expertise. Do you see virtual production opening up more opportunities for this market? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick off there. We, um, we feel pretty fortunate actually. So we just wrapped up producing a, a VR series um, in January, right before all the travel bans kicked in, and we just, you know, had this newfound appreciation for basically, you know, access and, and production. And obviously, it's been polarized now in terms of now looking at, you know, virtual production, real time production, and how we can maybe pivot a little bit more and get any shot from anywhere in the world from a warehouse studio somewhere, like the uh, volume that they use when they're making uh, the Mandalorian. Um, there's a really good actual VR studio. It's already been doing uh, real-time rendering called Spectre Studios just out of Sydney. Um, they're actually looking to build up a, a larger mm -hmm. LED wall at the moment. And I think at least as it stands here in Australia, it feels like the first stage is actually around education and actually trying to bring the whole industry forward. 
Um, cause there's definitely a lot of merit there and, and even the stuff that they're pushing out at the moment is, is really exciting. And then I feel like, um, once you, you know, understand the economics of the production and you realize that you can produce it faster and, and really at a higher quality, um, yeah, it's obviously a compelling proposition. And then I imagine the last stage is actually looking a little bit more around giving the user complete control. So rather than it just needing to be, you know, in 2D capacity, you're now actually in some form of XR and you're actually the director yourself and you're in complete control of the story and the perspective and how you get to engage with it. These industries have like been, you know, far apart for, for a little while. They're starting to actually finally really like converge. And I think that there's, there's some really great opportunities too in the production process of like, instead of approaching, um, you know, we make the film or we make the album and then a couple of years later, we want to make like an application that that is immersive and do that thing. And then we have to recreate all the assets and and like there are ways now to during real production uh, leverage different types of sam uh, sensors and cameras to actually you know capture that stuff in real time and be able to to make that pipeline like a lot smoother and more efficient. And I think um, there's a lot of goodness there for like the, the future of media and it's much more sustainable uh, as well, which is a great bonus. 100%. Uh, just a little thing. We There's a project I've been working with, with uh, a journalist academic and he's doing VR journalism. And so we've been, uh, this and a couple of other projects, we've been exploring the concept of what's a narrative in in VR, so in a normal movie, you have, the director has some control of where you're looking at the screen, but in VR, you can be looking in in any direction. And so, uh, you know, how do you direct, uh, and what are the the narrative grammars that you use in VR? Because not all the ones work. In uh, you can't take exactly how you made a movie. And put it into VR. Uh, we we were looking at a how do you do a montage in VR and not make everybody totally sick. Um, and so the, the, it's a you know montage is a very powerful metaphor in a movie, and you'd like to do that in VR. We were not totally successful, but it, it's it's like how do you translate these concepts from from one medium to another? Is I, th I think is a very interesting area and needs to be explored more. Yeah, definitely. And this definitely takes us to the next question, maybe. Um, uh, with the launch of Party Royale and Fortnite, which saw rapper Travis Scott viewed by 12.3 million gamers and Wave VR leading our Series B round for 30 mil um, for virtual concerts, do you see virtual um, avatar-based performance making a big impact on the immersive entertainment industry? I can answer this if you like. Um, so definitely, I mean, it's actually been happening for a long time in, in Japan um, with Hatsune Miku, um, the virtual character. She's been performing in virtual conference concerts since um, August of 2009. In fact, she was scheduled to appear at Coachella um, this year in, in, the, in the US. Um, hmm. So there's been a number of examples of people um, developing virtual characters that can um, can create lots of revenue. And then also, as of course, with Travis Scott's uh, constant example of a game company taking a, a real performer and bringing them into a social VR environment and, and generating, um, I, I can't remember how many, um, I guess there were 12 and a half million people who were attended, but then how many millions of views there are post um, event. And that, that of course was after the concert that Marshmallow had as well. So I think there's a huge opportunity now for avatar based performance. Um, and going back to what um, Rebecca was saying before, it seems like if you're a content company, you want to capture content once, but produce multiple times. So if you can capture your performers um, in, in, at, at one time and then, and then um, release them into multiple online venues or uh, apps or other ex VR and AR experiences, then you can create a huge amount of value around um, the performer and, and their brand. There's huge opportunities there, I think. I can. Uh, I think everyone. Hopefully, everyone can hear me now. But um, you know, we're uh, at Niantic, like working at a, at a similar type of thing. In that, whenever there's a you know, like a Pokemon Go day or a special you know announcement or a launch or there's some new mythical you know Pokemon that's released, 
um, that creates the same sort of you know crowd dynamic and fan behavior that uh, a concert does, you know, but out in the real world. And you know, obviously Niantic's coming at it from you know a sense of place and and city world scale experiences, not completely virtual like Fortnite. But it's something that we are you know really excited about is is the way that um, we see these types of entertainment experiences being blended between a live experience and a virtual experience. And, you know, I know, I know definitely, you know, it's something also Vanessa's, uh, Vanessa, Rebecca has been working on to, um, to sort of get beyond these things like Fortnite or the wave that are just virtual only and somehow tapping into the, the live experiences that we already emotionally connect to. And there's a, there's a huge amount of potential there that, that no one's tapped into yet. 100%. There's a, if you can, if you, especially with COVID, and you think about like places like Disney or, or other places which are going to be a sort of a compromised uh, ability to, 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 you know, capacity, right? Like they're the compromised capacity. If you're at 30%, the economics of that don't quite work out well. So I think that there's a really interesting opportunity. I think people will go back. They, we're fundamentally social like human beings and i think people will want that energy exchange and they will go back um but there is a, a an opportunity there to expand beyond the venue so like i i thought about this a lot during quarantine which is <laughs> it's like if mickey and minnie were on stage um and we're having a, a performance live at disney world and um it was also being captured you know with camera and sensor technology and you were able to send me a, a notification on my phone and say hey rebecca do you want to join uh this live performance of, of minnie and mickey happening right now at disney world um for a dollar 99 i would have done it in a heartbeat um and i think you saw that sort of desperation with like people going to instagram live and i know we got a million calls of like how do we put on a virtual concert in like the next three weeks and it's like well you don't you get on instagram live and you, you know, you use what what is out there. But like it, the the experience economy will never be caught in this position again. And I really think that there is a lot of opportunity to to make these really amazing, made for the stage AR enhanced shows that also are able to be captured and simulcast uh, for different types of platforms. I think that's a, a great space for innovation. Just to follow up with what you said, Rebecca, um, I think one thing that was key with Travis Scott's performance is that it enabled people from global to attend the same event. And as you're saying, you know, you could now have the opportunity to have a, a physical event, but having a global audience that they can attend. And, as, and certainly with the technology we're developing in our lab, um, it's possible to have a real person walking through Disney and then live stream that environment to dozens or hundreds of, of remote people. So for every real person in, in Disneyland, you could have hundreds of people um, viewing remotely and paying a few dollars to have um, a, a Disney experience. So it's a really exciting opportunity to both um, have global audiences attending virtual events, but also have real people um, bring in um, virtual attendees um, to experience uh, through telepresence um, their own experience as well. And you know, yeah, the people thing. will pay money to have a, to, to have a, a, to go on a Disney tour with a celebrity. You know, I'd pay to go to Disney with, with Matt Damon and 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 see and, ha and see him go the, view the rise and hear his commentary and and feel like I'm um, in his body while he's doing that um, experience. Interesting to think of like Fortnite. You know, I was thinking of it as like an analogy for for the current live events industry, and it's kind of like. They've got the footprint that's that's like the physical version of Live Nation, you know, like they're like a birth. They've got a virtual version of that footprint, which is really hard to generate that kind of a platform with repeated attendance, like unless you do it through like MMO gaming um, and you, yeah. you just have such such a uh, a massive platform already. But it's kind of an interesting analogy for like the virtual version of physical uh, live event spaces. It's really interesting, like what Fortnite achieved, you know, 12 million simultaneous users at the same time. And like you're pointing out, Rebecca, like the the budget and the technical, you know, requirements for that together is obviously, you know, paramount. Um, and then how do you make it a little bit more accessible for, 
you know, the mainstream artist that's trying to connect the current tour around the world at the moment. I definitely know when I was trying to Nundi, you know, I was thinking about watching the Sigur Ross performance and seeing these sound spirits around you and, and having that kind of translate into the XR world. But then, you know, there's some really interesting things already underway for a long time now, like for the venues. People are able to jump in and have live comedy and performances. And I think um, how you build that bridge, and I know that Magic Week made some recent acquisitions around this kind of telepresence next next step. And I'm excited to see how that sort of could transform into the low entertainment space. Because, you know, on one hand, through this digital metaverse, you can do just about anything, right? And that's what's really exciting. But then at the same time, you can't really replace the same sensation of physically being there and then looking around and having that audio moment where you realize that we're all in it together. And so I wonder how those two will, will converge in this post-COVID times. I'm pretty excited to see, yeah, what happens next. So I think that's a really good point, Trent. I mean, the other issue is that, um, you know, I, I guess Epic would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars um, getting the Trent um, um, Scott experience underway but with things like the PyTorch you talked about now and other things you know that, that it should be possible for um, performers to do that for just tens of thousands of dollars and then in, in five years time you know a few hundreds of dollars and so what that means now is you can have a, a, a for a niche performers that can basically perform to a global audience you, you don't have to you know if you're um you, if you're a, a band that previously played in a coffee house with 20 people there's no reason why you couldn't use that technology and still do that same performance but have millions of people um, viewing that globally or hundreds of thousands of people and, and um, that would be your niche audience. So it's a really exciting opportunity for performers now because they can now through having uh, virtual avatar based performances get um, their performance out to a global stage which would have been impossible um, uh, you know, just five or ten years ago where they, they couldn't have done the tour cost or anything like that. 100%. Um, probably brings us off to our last question I think we have time for. Um, on the topic of avatar one of the interesting trends gaining attention in immersive media is the representation of one's identity. So from AI-powered avatars, virtual influences, and the ability to somewhat customise your own presence in VR spaces, where do you see this trend going and what's the significance? I, I think this is a trend. Um, it, it's not just avatars that you wear, but it's it's going to be your, you know, your, your Snapchat lenses or your Instagram face filters. It'll... It'll just be part of getting dressed in the morning that you choose what to put on and accept that it's it's dynamic and not only dynamic in that it's animated, but in that each of you could be seeing a different representation of me, you know, which is different to what the audience sees. And that uh, potential for, you know, fashion designers, your digital fashion designers to be a whole industry that you know, doesn't exist today or, and all of the, you know, the, the, the privacy aspects and the way you can filter and reveal like parts of you know parts of yourself that you you do or don't want to reveal and the way they will adapt to different you know different social networks or different mmos that you inhabit so i think that you know we're at the earliest stages of of what's probably going to be the biggest um you know the biggest thing that we invest our time and energy and and invest ourselves into which is how do we how do we represent and project ourselves out into the world um so i'm i'm yeah very very bullish on that trend and would would back you know lots of different ideas that i think can can tap into it so what one challenge i think is going to be is, is about authenticity and deep fakes you know if if um uh, trent scott is performing how do we know it's really Trent Scott? And, you know, within ten, a few years' time, um, I could appear as Trent Scott, and there could be hundreds of Trent Scotts appearing at the same time. So how do we know that they're, that's really the, the right person? Well, and then also okay. the, the rights, you know. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's already a business around rights to people who've um, deceased. Um, so who owns, um, you know, could I appear as, as Marilyn Monroe or... Um, or companies like the Blue Man Group that create multiple copies themselves globally. Uh, we, we have artists that will train up real people to um, look and act like them, and so then they could run multiple events globally at the same time. So there's going to be a lot of different impacts in the in the. Well, once you have the ability to have, um, which which pretty much already have, to have anybody look like somebody else and and soon sound like somebody else, then how will we know? That the performers are actually the real performers and and will performers use that ability to create lots of copies of themselves to dramatically increase the amount of revenue they can produce by 
hosting multiple events at the same time. Mm. It was an interesting um, piece of research I did a few years ago when I was studying psychology around Second Life, and you had um, people creating avatars that were almost like living, you know, these alternative lives, right? There were people that were paraplegics creating, you know, these these avatars that were all around like athletes and, and you know, runners and, and kind of extend, you know, beyond our physical constraints, which I thought was, was really interesting. And then, like you mentioned, things around deep fakes and the implications there are a little bit scary, but um, it's it's really cool to see at least where we're at currently virtual collaboration. Uh, we tried doing a few things around generating avatars and we realized, you know, it effectively needs to be fast and easy and convincing. Uh, looking at spatial, you know, their application is really easy. You take a photo and then instantly you're made into a little, you know, avatar of you. Um, you know, alternatively, we try that alt space, the low poly version where you get to quickly whip up an avatar. And um, it was interesting. We ran an exercise with our team. We ran all hands and we all met in alt space. And it was interesting to see these personalities, you know, in person and see them translate to their virtual avatars and people more expressive and being a little bit more jovial. And I think it kind of opens up some of these, you know, limitations that we maybe are inhibited in terms of how we express ourselves. So hopefully that should translate a little bit more openly. Yeah. I think it depends. It definitely depends on, on the circumstance and like, you know, within entertainment, you can have, you can have a lot more fun with it. Although I, I would say in, in practical application, uh, artists naturally, um, especially the big ones can be pretty filthy about sort of how they come across, whether as an avatar or as in a volumetric version of themselves. And, um, and, you know, especially when it comes to volumetric, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done there to to make that you know that the, the data still can be pretty flawed right and so um if you have somebody that's really really fussy about how their their appearance is coming uh across there are some limitations they're getting so much better literally by the day like leaps and bounds your ability to actually like you know have a really high quality high fidelity life scale uh volumetric of, of an artist but but we also see like you know, in a business context or in a med tech context, um, people prefer, they want to see a, a valid representation of a human um, because we're used to reading human behavior and we're used to, to looking at each other and you, you definitely don't want to get, you know, like a difficult diagnosis from something with like wiggly arms. Uh, so, so I think there's like, it, it really depends on the use case, um, and and certainly with entertainment, you have a lot more uh, liberty. But I think it, it it's still pretty like it's still pretty laborious on the art side to try to create a version of an avatar that like an artist really falls in love with and sees as an accurate brand representation of of themselves. Um, but maybe as that as that stuff becomes more familiar, uh, you know, people will just see it as a creative outlet. But we are used to like, you know. Like when I get into an environment where somebody is a is an avatar, um, and if they design their own avatar, I find myself spending a lot of time thinking about why they made the aesthetic choices of their avatar versus focusing on the conversation, which maybe is just a flaw for me. But I'm always like, why? Um, so you know, I think it depends on the context. Um, I'm gonna um have to cut you. Off. Um, there, uh, so wrap, we're going to wrap the panel now because we're going to hand over to Jessica um, and probably uh, if anyone has any more questions, take this offline. Um, very fascinating, uh, fascinating subject and uh, something I'm certainly looking at as well. Um, Jessica, did you want to jump in with the Slido question? Sure. Coming through. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you so much um, to, to Carly and to the panel. And really quickly before I go into the questions, um, I, I wanted um, just Matt um, now that we have the sound, if you could just um, just provide a quick overview of who you are and what you do, that would really be helpful. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Matt. I'm, I'm advising Niantic. Uh, Niantic's the, the company that makes Pokemon Go, uh, most famously, amongst like Harry Potter and Ingress and some other games about augmented reality over the world. And I ended up advising Niantic after I sold my startup to Niantic. And I had a, a startup called 6D.ai that was all about capturing um, the real world and sort of making a digital copy of the entire world and making that available for you know games and any type of application to kind of run on top of. So the sort of stuff that I think we're talking about here, which which might 
you know, might be possible in a, in a stage or a museum or sort of a controlled environment. Um, Niantic is really, you know, leveraging what 6D did and, and their own work to build that capability for the whole world. So you could have that Travis Scott concert um, in your backyard or in the local town park uh, and have it, you know, copied everywhere. So um, that's that's me. Thank you. Thank you for, um, and congratulations on the acquisition. And also just to call out something else exciting, um, Trent's company uh, also just won two Webbies. So um, just wanted to update yes. that because that's also pretty exciting. Um, now to, to jump into some of the questions that we have uh, on Slido. So, you know, a lot of what's been coming up this week and a lot of these panels that we've been having is the idea of Australia as a test market um, for for things. And so, you know, what the question on, on Slido is, what is Australia's competitive advantage for immersive technology and why would a U.S. company choose Australia for immersive projects or for immersive R&D? I can answer that briefly. So, first of all, it may not be well known, but the University of South Australia that Bruce and I are both of publish more research papers in AR than anywhere else in the world. And by, by at least 100 or so more papers, um, so it's quite, quite a margin. And, and then we are just recently um, um, working on a Australian-New Zealand network called ARRIVE, which combines eight universities together, which is about 250 researchers and more than $30 million of R&D capability. So it'll be the largest academic research network in the world for doing AR, VR, and XR research. And so it you know, provides a one-stop shop for companies to come to Australia and to do research um, with us at University of South Australia and also engage with the broader group. So th there's a lot of capability there, and then also some very unique research capabilities. Um, you know, Bruce has already talked about his redirected haptics, and we're doing work on telepresence, and we're doing work on EEG to measure people's emotional experience in, in entertainment applications. So I think in terms of the unit capability we have, in terms of the research outputs and the quality of researchers, and then the, the, the larger network uh, through the ARRIVE network in terms of reach, we have a really unique opportunity to offer the world. And then also, um, you know, quite frankly, it's, it's, it's very cost effective. If, if you want to do um, research in the US, you know, to do uh, engage with the university and to fund a PhD student, you're looking at about 100 grand a year for a Stanford PhD. Um, you can get two people for that in Australia. And not only that, the Australian PhDs work full time for you on their projects, whereas the US PhDs are doing coursework and classes and tutoring and everything at the same time. So you're getting twice as many people and they're working twice as hard. So a lot of really great reasons for coming to Australia and doing research. Um, just just a, to an ad there for for the price of a PhD student, you can get a full time postdoc. So yeah, that's true. Uh, and then but, course, from the Australian perspective, the Australian government provides really attractive incentives for companies to do R and D and do their projects in Australia. And I'm sure somebody else can talk to that. But yeah, there's a lot of reasons. Um, and I'm going to actually send out some information on that to the to the people on the uh, on the webinar afterwards. But Australia does have, um, depending on your turnover, your revenue <clears throat> in Australia, we have up to a 43.5 cents to the dollar R and D incentive. Um, so it is it is uh, a pretty pretty good um, incentive in Australia, um, and combined with the exchange rate, and more importantly, combined with talent, um, it, it, it's uh, really it's a very effective. Um, and one thing to mention too, Jessica, of course, is COVID. So I'm, I'm currently stuck in New Zealand, and this week in New Zealand, they just restarted production of Avatar, and um, Amazon just started the Lord of the Rings. And we can do that because the country is basically COVID-free, and Australia will be COVID-free in uh, a matter of a few weeks. And so, again, for some companies wanting to do an immersive sort of projects, um, it may be great to be able to do the projects in a country where you don't have COVID restrictions um, on operating your, your production. Is a very good point and thank you for for adding that um just, just quickly definitely uh, i'd like to say with a little bit of bias that i think the people and the culture you know i think as australians we're definitely um early adopters in, in the tech space but i feel what australia does really well is actually um, work in the creative space i think where the ideas come from in terms of xr right now a lot of it is you know storytelling creating new types of experiences and yeah, I'm really amazed with so many other immersive tech startups in, in Australia here. And you definitely, your money goes a lot further. And, and you know, when you work with an Aussie company, you know, they're going to go above and beyond to get it done. They're not just going to hit the brief and ship it. They're going to make sure that it, you know, elevates the bar. So that's a really um, 
what we find is good here. Definitely not, not having to compete in terms of the talent pool um, with some of the larger tech companies, you know, coming out of the US at the moment. So I feel like we're, we're pretty fortunate for the people that we have here in Australia. Thanks, Trent. Um, yes. I, my, the, another question that was on the Slido is, in our city, the XR community and creative community are siloed and don't communicate with each other. How do you think we can break down the silos? Each city in Kali, like um, the community that she's been building is, yeah, an amazing inspiration. Well, I, the, I can honestly say University of South Australia, you know, actively tries to engage uh, end users and, and, and uh, companies. And, you know, we, well, I, you know, works with artists and designers. I mean, it's, it's in our DNA. So I think, well, I think when you, when you create whatever group that you want to do to work on XR, you, you need to incorporate at the very beginning all these different disciplines and, you know, actively seek them out. For that, um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk, I'm going to take one of the questions that was on Slido and I'm going to open up a little bit more, which is, um, I'd like to ask each panel and this will be likely our final question, but I'd like to ask each panelist, what is your dream project to work on? And I'm, let's, let's limit it to within the entertainment industry, uh, entertainment field, since that is the topic, but what is your dream project? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kick off if that's all right. So, yeah, I feel really fortunate right now. Um, the two last major projects that we shipped, um, working with the likes of, you know, Oculus, uh, WWF, uh, Netflix, another company, Silverback. Um, for us, at least, you know, we're, we're creating these new types of experiences, but they definitely have some pretty important and meaningful messages that we believe the world really needs to hear right now. And so, yeah to be creating almost like mind opening experiences that can actually extend our connection, you know, with the planet or with people uh, and nature more broadly. I feel like that's definitely something that excites us the most is actually this, this notion of XR for good. feels like there's a lot of rifts and pain that's being felt, you know, globally. Um, hopefully that these, you know, new tools and mediums can actually be something that can help repair some of the rifts that, that we're currently kind of you know, embracing or, you know, bracing through. So that's, that's at least, um, yeah, kind of living the dream right now. I'll humbly. Awesome. Uh, yep. Um, well, for those of you that, that know uh, about Tunendi, you won't be surprised by this, but, uh, <laughs> but I would say that, um, definitely the dream scenario is to do, um, like a, a concert experience that is uh, enhanced with AR uh, and XR in, in you know participation uh, in the way that I know that it can be, uh, <laughs> and I think that infrastructure is starting to be laid down today, which is really exciting. And so prototype, this is a super fun time to start prototyping and pushing the limits of like how you can leverage like master show control integrations to have really like synchronous powerful uh moments of, of real immersion and and active uh ar you know experience elements and then being able to test that uh by also being able to broadcast it simultaneously um to people on various platforms uh to be able to to join in from all around the world um and i think that that's just like that's the dream gig right like i don't know that i necessarily think that we are mature enough to do that today <laughs> but I sure as hell would try. Uh, for, me, for me, it would be just, I think, taking some of the ideas that we're working on at, at 6D around getting a, a digital you know, mirror world of the real world and sort of pushing that a bit further with, with there were, you know, some artists we were, we were talking to and started to work with around how do you, how do you take art, whether that's you know, like, a, like a public street art or music or something, and be able to represent that in context with with the world around you, um, I think if you saw Snapchat's announcement recently, they they did this, this sort of land markers that let you, you know, do like a face filter but painted on the side of a building, and you know that type of idea about in the real world. But instead of just you know random people throwing stuff up there, it was it was sort of created by artists, but then adapts dynamically to the to the place. So. Um, 
that that idea, I think, the, the potential to make the world more interesting, more beautiful, everything that we see kind of reacting um, contextually to what's going on around it, I think is is something that really excites me. Um, for me in the entertainment spectrum, I just would like to lower the, the friction of somebody using the interaction. I've been playing Alex Half-Life and although it's a it's a real step up from what's been in the past, it's parts of it are still really clunky. I just want to, you know, I I want to I want to feel like I'm in the world and I'm just interacting with everything around me. I and I, I don't know how to do that, but uh, I I just would like that to be just you more feel like you're in the in the world. And for, for me, I'm, I'm, so I'm from the empathic empathic computing lab, and so our whole focus of our lab is trying to create empathy and trying to enable somebody to know what it feels like to be somebody else and to share an experience in real time to, to have that feeling. So a dream project for me would be to work with um, a entertainment company to enable members of the their audience to feel the experience of being on stage and being a performer and being the um, you know the the, the star of, of their own um, show. And I think we're, we're getting there. So I think you know, with the content capture capabilities and sharing we, we've got, we, we pretty much now can do the streaming part. And I think within five to 10 years time, we'll have the ability to capture and represent emotion remotely. So I can know how somebody's feeling when they're competing in an event and I can share those feelings with that person. You feel like I'm competing in that same event or I'm, or I'm in that same concert. So that would be a really exciting project for me. Well, I mean, we, we talking about empathy, I mean, could, could there have been, frankly, a, a more important topic um, this day and age. So that is a, a, a really, really good place to, to end. Uh, I just want to thank everyone who is on this panel. Um, thank you, Bruce and Carly and Mark and Matt, Rebecca and Trent. Um, this has been very enlightening. Uh, I, I personally have learned a lot and I think clearly there's a way to go, but at the same time, it seems like there are a lot of really interesting moving parts and a lot of research that companies can adopt now um, to, to, to plan for, you know, the future. And so I really, really appreciate this. And, um, you know, if, uh, obviously we're keen to continue this conversation. So, um, if anyone, uh, you know, wants to reach out to me, um, we're going to send up a follow-up email with some information and I'll put my email address in there and, uh, there's Mark's contact information as well. So we're just really excited to continue this conversation and to, uh, continue to use technology to um, improve life and to improve engagement and, uh, and empathy overall. It's a great, it's a great ending. So thank you again and wish everyone uh, a great morning, evening, uh, afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks very much. Everyone. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.